Welcome to iPad Pros, the show all about professionals using the iPad to be productive and get work done. I'm Tim Chen, host of the show. The built-in screen recording on iOS takes two audio tracks. So it takes the internal audio track. So if you like click around and then there's internal button sounds or whatever, it records that audio. But then you can also enable the microphone. So I'll plug my Blue Yeti microphone into my iPad. And then what it'll do is it'll record that track. Now, before in LumaFusion, what would happen is it would just bring one of those audio tracks in. And usually it was just the internal microphone. Now what you can do is when you bring that video track in, you can pick between either track one or track two. Today in the podcast is Christopher Lolly. Christopher runs a pretty great YouTube channel all about getting work done on the iPad. We dive into a bunch of different topics, including video editing on the iPad, external keyboards, and what we want to see next in iOS, and much more. Here's my interview with Christopher. Enjoy. I'm here with Christopher Lolly of ChristopherLolly.com. Welcome, Christopher. Hey, thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm really, really excited to be here. I really like the show. Oh, thank you so much. And I'm excited to have you on the show as well, because I've been looking through your channel, and you have been creating a lot of great content based on the notion of working on you know ios on your ipad and i want to dive into a lot of different topics we probably won't have time to cover all of them so let's just i I guess start out with your most recent video and i should say you've got uh the untitled site which is christopherlolly.com and then you also uh have the youtube channel which i guess feeds content into your your main site is that kind of the the setup for the content you create yeah so originally i was using my website and i was blogging a lot but I realized I was a terrible writer and I have a background in filmmaking. I've been doing video stuff since I was like 12 years old. I realized I really wanted to get back into video stuff. So I kind of wanted to combine those two things. So I, I started doing videos about iPad, iOS, just general Apple stuff in particular. It became a hobby and then I, I just fell in love doing it and I just started doing it more and more. And then about last February, I found the app Luma Fusion. And I started doing everything completely off my iPad. It's been a, almost a year now since it's the end of January right now that we're recording this. So it's been almost a year that I've been completely iPad only. That's awesome. What's your kind of background for the iPad? Did you jump on day one with the 2010 model or how, when did you jump into iPad land? When the iPad 2 came out, I the iPad 1 was going on sale and I figured I'd just kind of pick one up. I wasn't too sure about it at first. I had a MacBook Pro at the time. I had an iPhone. And those two things really just served me really well. I I didn't really feel the need for an iPad originally when it first came out. And then when I got it, it was really just a content consumption device. I used it to read things on the internet, read comics, you know, just watch some YouTube videos and Netflix when the app, uh, you know, finally came out to the iPad and things like that. And then when the iPad Pro came out, a lot of people started talking about doing work off the iPad. And it was something that was really interesting to me. I was very curious about how it could serve me. And at the time, I was really starting to get into blogging and stuff like that. And I felt my MacBook Pro to be very distracting. It was very easy for me to tab over to Twitter or, you know, the Internet or just whatever. And I really wanted a device that I could just completely use to focus just on what I was working on. So writing at the time. And the iPad really fit that niche for me. And so when the iPad Pro came out, and I was a little late to when it picking one up, I believe it it launched in November of 2015. And I didn't pick one up till January 2016. Okay. And is that the model uh, you're using today? The first generation uh, Pro? I actually just recently upgraded to the 2017 12.9 inch one. I was kind of reluctant at first because my iPad was serving me well, but those speed boosts, like I, you just can't deny them. And since I'm doing a lot of 4K video, I want as much power and speed as I can possibly get behind that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, storage, what did you initially go for and what did you go for the second time around? Did that change much? I think the first time around for the first generation iPad Pro, I went with the 128 gig one. I believe that was the middle tier one. Mm-hmm. And then this time around, I went with the 512 gig one because I want to keep as much low local video as possible on it. Yeah, absolutely. And with the 128 gig one, I was constantly running out of space. 
Yeah, I made the mistake of buying a 32 gigabyte Pro for my first one because of financial constraints, and that yeah. really encouraged me to speed up the getting of the second generation. So I, I went with 512 as well, so I would never, ever have the headaches I had with 32 gig. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. It, it's expensive. It's definitely not cheap to go with the high-end storage model, but when you're doing video or you're living off this device completely, it's definitely worth it to get as much storage as you can afford yeah absolutely and it's it's amazing they did come out with the 512 gigabyte model because yeah, you know the iphone is still stuck uh, below that and, and you know the ipad they for a reason you know gave us the extra storage here and i'm glad for that one thing i want to dive into is video editing on ios can you tell me a little bit about luma fusion and how you're using it yeah so to back up just briefly i i mentioned i've been doing video editing for a long time i i started off with a lot of free software and then i graduated to the adobe suite i used final cut stuff for a little while but i, I did a lot of adobe stuff wanted after effects and a few other programs in there like photoshop and stuff like that last year i was really really focused on becoming ipad only like it was it was a goal for me i started that goal off in the beginning of the year and i didn't realize how quickly i hit that goal so in fact February, I found Luma Fusion, and I think it launched the year before too. I was just late to finding it. Yeah, it was December, I think, of the previous year, so it's it's still pretty new of, a, of an yeah. application. Yeah, yeah, I, I found it a couple months after it came out, and and um, it, it was kind of weird too because there was no press on it at all. And to me, it's definitely one of the most powerful applications on the App Store. It's it's crazy that you have this multi-track video editing software on the iPad and the iPad can absolutely handle it. It's definitely powerful enough to handle it, but it's the only multi-track video editing software on the iPad and it runs like Premiere or Final Cut. Now there are things that Premiere and Final Cut can do that LumaFusion can't just because of the constraints that they're working in right now because of, you know, sandboxing and things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. But I think with LumaFusion, it's unlocked a lot for a lot of different filmmakers. For me, I, you know, I do a lot of tech videos, but I also do some freelance stuff and I do it all from my iPad. For me, LumaFusion is the application that's allowed me to work just off my iPad. And if anybody's interested in filmmaking or anything like that, I've definitely been pointing them to look at LumaFusion. For $20, that is the cheapest multi-track video editing software you can possibly get. Other than, you know, some free thing that's not going to work very well. But this is absolutely fantastic piece of software. Every once in a while, I'll hear from somebody that's a really expensive application. But if, if you look at something like Final Cut Pro where it's like a $300 application, LumaFusion is a bargain. And the fact that it just can run on an iPad is fantastic. It, it really opens the door for a lot of people that don't have to go out and buy a Mac Pro anymore. You don't have to have 10 years of film school and you know know somebody in the business. You can just grab an iPad. You can film your video right on the iPad. You can edit right on the iPad. You don't have to even have an iPad Pro. One of the new cheap models runs it just fine. I, I have a friend of mine that had one, and I, I threw LumaFusion on there really quick, and I wanted to see how it worked. And it edited 4K video fine. It wasn't you know super snappy like it is on the iPad Pro, but it worked. Yeah, the exports probably that where you get the more slowdown. Uh, the editing, I'm sure, is pretty good. One of the things I love most about it is just uh, that frame editor where you just go in there and resize and put everything exactly how you want it in your frame. And it's it's so so well designed. Yeah, that I believe that's a that's a new the the framing is is was in one of the recent updates, and it's a fantastic update that they just put out. And I love that they're they're just constantly bringing new things to the application. They just brought chroma key support, and one of my favorite things is they just brought in the last version the ability to pick between two audio tracks. So if a video clip has two audio tracks built into it, you can pick between the two. So what that unlocks for me is when I do screen recording on my iPad, I can record my audio and do the screen recording on the iPad at the same time so I can narrate the track as I go through and then I can just pick that second video track when I import. Explain that again. Okay, so you're doing a screen record using the built-in iPad screen recording where you're doing narration, yeah. right? Yeah, so the, the built-in screen recording on iOS Wes takes two audio tracks. So it takes the internal audio track. So if you like click around and then there's internal button sounds or whatever, it records that audio. But then you can also enable the microphone. So I'll plug my Blue Yeti microphone into my iPad. And then what it'll do is it'll record that track. 
Now, before in LumaFusion, what would happen is it would just bring one of those audio tracks in. And usually it was just the internal microphone. It kind of seemed like it was random, but maybe there was some purpose behind it. I don't know. I'm, you know, not the developer for it. But now what you can do is when you bring that video track in, you can pick between either track one or track two. And that's for the audio tracks. So you can pick the microphone track so it will ditch the internal audio track and then I'll just pick the microphone track. That is killer. I had no idea. Yeah, so now I can narrate my videos. Yeah, it's so fantastic. I had no idea the screen recording was capturing both tracks when I was doing the mic option. That's the only sound I hear. I thought all internal sounds, like software sounds, right, were muted. But that's not the case. Like if I'm playing music... That'll be captured on a sec, sec, separate track? Yep. There's, when you do screen recording, it comes with two audio tracks. And sometimes, and this can get a little weird, sometimes your frame rate can get off. LumaFusion does a good good job of syncing everything up. If you throw it into like Premiere Pro, or I, I had this problem one time where I had these video clips that I was trying to do that same thing before LumaFusion did that update. And for whatever reason, this is when I was first figuring out screen recording when iOS 11 was in beta and stuff like that. I couldn't figure out why my microphone track wasn't showing up. So I threw it in Premiere Pro. I busted out a MacBook Pro. I threw it in Premiere Pro. And it actually, the frame rate gets off. The audio track doesn't sync up right if you don't set it up exactly right. It's kind of weird the way it works. So you kind of, but LumaFusion does this awesome job of syncing everything up properly. And are you able to, so you're able to split the audio off of the video for one track things. Are you able to split both of those audios away from the video to, you know, split between the two tracks? You know, I haven't tried that out yet. The update just came out a couple of weeks ago, so I haven't had too much time to play with it. Okay. That is a good question. And have you done much with the chroma key, the green screen? and LumaFusion yet? No, I don't. I've always kind of had a firm stance against chroma key. Unless you have the proper equipment, the proper money, the stuff to go into it, you're never going to get a really good looking chroma key. So I haven't played with it too much. I have a friend of mine that has that kind of setup, and I need to go over there and, and mess with it a little bit. So one thing I want to talk to you about is keyboards for the iPad. I understand you have tested quite a few of them and gone through probably different phases of which ones you like more than others. Which keyboards have you played with? Which ones do you like? Which ones would you stay away from? Can you kind of dive into that? that? Uh, I don't know if we have enough time to talk about all the ones <laughs> I've tested. <laughs> I am afraid to add up the amount of money I've spent on keyboards. Now, I've sent most of them back. Right now, the keyboard that is on my desk, it's actually a mechanical keyboard. It's the code keyboard. And I really like this one. I've always liked the mechanical keyboards. I've always liked the clicky clackety sound of them yeah. um, they're just really fun so i have that one right now it's usb so you have to plug it into the camera connection kit from apple if you do get this one you have to get the camera connection kit with the lightning port because this thing will just drain your battery in a heartbeat it will destroy your battery the ones that i've been using a lot lately since i've been moving and i've kind of had to find really awkward places to work are the smart connector keyboard i think that's just kind of a go-to keyboard for people that want to work off their ipad it's not the best it has compromises but it works and it works consistently that's my go-to i'm taking my ipad with me somewhere and it's just attached to it and then at like my desk i'll have a different keyboard that's not as portable i'm in the same boat i i like that one because it's portable it's small and i don't have to worry about charging it so i personally think it feels better than apple's laptop keyboards but oh absolutely <laughs> their best keyboard is on ios right now uh, yeah, yeah i completely agree i have never really been a fan of the laptop keyboards they're very mushy and then the new laptops keyboards i just can't stand those but the other keyboard that i, I really like using is the magic keyboard what I do with that is I have from Studio Neat, they have a product called the Canopy. And it basically, you take the Magic Keyboard, you stick it in there, and it kind of folds up. And it folds around. And if you go check out the website, it, it, it makes sense. I know when, as I'm describing it, it doesn't sound right. But basically, it folds up. You put your iPad in there. It just sits there. And you can use the Magic Keyboard, which I really like. I think it it's based on kind of the laptop key feels. But I think it has a little bit more travel, which I think works a little bit better for me. And plus, the battery life on that thing lasts forever. So it's it's fantastic. The canopy is also a really good one. It folds up really neat. So if you need to stick it in a backpack, it's really easy to use. I've tried like the Logitech Create keyboard. I couldn't stand those. I sent that back. I tried the Logitech Slim Combo keyboard that came out with the last round of iPads. I didn't like that one either. I, didn't, I don't like the whole kickstand approach. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it feels very um, Microsoft-y to me, and I, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Have you uh, been tempted to get a 10.5 inch iPad 
to complement the bigger one and do the multi pad setup thing? You know, it's it's funny you say that because the last couple of weeks. I've been looking at 10.5 inch pads and trying to talk myself out of getting one. I don't need it. I want it, but I don't need <laughs> it. I think for me personally, the 12.9 is the size to go because I'm editing video. I'm editing photos. I want that bigger screen real estate. Even when I'm traveling, I know it's a little bit heavier. This thing is absolutely huge for an iPad. But when I'm working, it's the best screen. It's the best device for what I'm doing. I would like something a little bit smaller for sitting on the couch or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I think what I would do if if I did get a second iPad, I don't know if I would get a 10.5 inch iPad Pro, but I'd probably get the the cheap 9.7 inch iPad, the kind of the entry level one that's out now. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah. And the work you do isn't one where you'd want to have a second iPad simultaneously, like a reference monitor kind of thing that you're working just one app at a time kind of thing. And a lot of the apps, so like LumaFusion, and and this is definitely not a knock against the app because I I honestly think that would probably be next to impossible right now. But like LumaFusion doesn't sync projects between devices. So if I was editing a video on my 12.9 inch iPad Pro, I'm going to be editing that video on my 12.9 inch iPad Pro. And I know you can export the project and things like that, but I'd just be afraid, you know, I wouldn't have some asset in the right place and it would just, it wouldn't work. If I start editing a video on one iPad, I want it to work just keep working off that one ipad yeah now apple pencil i'm not an artist but i love my apple pencil i have to charge it a lot because i use it a lot (laughs) what uses have you found for your apple pencil i absolutely love the apple pencil And, and like you said i'm i'm no artist either i can't draw anything but what i love about the apple pencil is there's just something about it. It feels good to use. And then on top of that, it's great for editing video. It's it's great for just kind of having that extension to your hand. I have some RSI issues, so it, it helps me kind of change up the way my hands are, are situated. So I'm not constantly, you know, keeping the same motion or stuck my hands stuck on the keyboard. I like using it in Ferrite a lot. I think Ferrite is probably one of the best non-drawing applications that the Apple Pencil is designed for. If you go into the settings, you can tweak it a little bit. What's great about the Ferrite and the Apple Pencil is you can make edits with the Apple Pencil, then it'll set up so that with your hand, you do pinch to zoom and move around and things like that. The Apple Pencil is a great device. If you're not an artist, there's still use cases for you. Like I handwrite notes when I write a script or something like that. When I'm done, I send it to Notability and I'll have the script like triple space and like really large font. And what I can do is I can make notes on my script. So any grammatical errors or anything that I want to change, I don't like the wording of a sentence or anything like that. I can I can change that. It's just a little bit easier to do. And you can kind of go sit down in a chair. You can get up from your desk and kind of walk away and go sit down in a chair and edit a script that way. Yeah, wonderful. And I noticed with when I got my second generation iPad Pro, I used the pencil a lot more because it did feel that much better. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, I see you work with the USB hub for the iPad, at least a little bit. What kind of accessories do you like to use with that? And what kind of stumbling blocks, if any, do you have with the hubs and things like that? The hub idea came from wanting to set up my mechanical keyboard, and I wanted to be able to use my microphone at the same time. So with the camera connection kit lightning adapter, you can only have one USB device plugged into it. So I was kind of thinking I I have this anchor, I think it's like a seven port USB hub, and I was curious to see if it would work. So I plugged my microphone into it, my my, uh, mechanical keyboard into it. I plugged a lightning cable into it. So I I set the, the camera connection kit to charge my device and then plugged the camera connection kit straight into the hub. And I was able to work both my microphone and my mechanical keyboard off of it. And it was kind of a really cool idea. I didn't honestly think it would work. The only way that I was able to make it work, though, I think, is the fact that the USB hub that I was using is powered. So it's not one that you just plug a USB cable into. It has to be plugged into an actual outlet. Mm -hmm. And I think that was the only way I could get enough juice to power all the devices. But with that, I'm able to charge my iPad, use my mechanical keyboard and my microphone at the same time. And if you were tempted, you could throw an Ethernet to that as well. (laughs) Have you played around with that at all? Yeah, I could. The office that I'm all set up in doesn't have any cabling in it. I absolutely could. I could do Ethernet. And there's a few other things, too. You you could plug removable hard drives in if you have photos or something on there that you want to import. I really wish uh, one of my big, big wish list items in iOS 12, and this was actually something I didn't think I wanted for a long time, but I'm here now, is I want external hard drive support. It it has to happen. Mm -hmm. There's a files app. 
apps yep. should be able to just talk natively to it. it it's baffling yeah it's, it's right there it's so close i have a lightning to sd card reader and whenever i plug an sd card into it it automatically opens the photos app it shouldn't do that it should give me either the option to open photos or it should give me the option to you know open it in files and i should be able to throw things to it not just take stuff off of it yeah and outside of that is there anything else you'd like from the mac to come over to ios that you're missing oh so much stuff my big wish list item is pro applications from apple i want to see them bring final cut pro 10 i want them to bring logic and i really really want to see xcode and I know it won't be like the port of the desktop version. And I, and I don't want the port of the desktop version. I want a iPad version of that. And if that means it's stripped down, that means it's stripped down a little bit. But I really think these devices are powerful enough now. And they absolutely deserve to be treated like their own platform. And I don't think the iPad will ever be truly its own platform until you can write an iPad app on the iPad. Yeah, I can't agree more. And you do coding as well, a little bit, right? Is that part uh, of a, your... a little bit. I mostly mess around. I have a few small projects that I work on that are just kind of like some home automation things and some server-based things that haven't ever seen the light of day that I don't really talk about too much. But I, I use an app called Coda on my uh, iPad here. And it's actually started off, it's uh, from the guys from Panic. They, they make a lot of great Mac software and they brought it to the iPad. And it's a terrific application if you're interested in writing code. It supports all sorts of different languages, has FTP support, SFTP, all, all the great stuff. I haven't really come across a use case that it doesn't work for me. I've been teaching myself Swift. I've done some Swift stuff. I've done some Perl stuff a, a little bit. I, that's a language that's really hard to understand. <laughs> Ruby on Rails, that's another one that's really, really crazy to understand. You know, Java, mm-hmm. JavaScript, the basics. The stuff that I've mostly done is mostly JavaScript. It's nothing super exciting. And it's honestly, I would probably never show it to anybody because of how, how bad it is and how embarrassing it is. Just some stuff to control some music players and some speakers and stuff around the house to kind of hack my way to multi room audio. <laughs> <laughs> Have you done the playgrounds thing from apple to learn swift at all Uh, yeah you know that that's actually how i got really into swift i think was one of those things that apple did and it came out that year of ios 10 and everybody was kind of feeling a little lukewarm about you know what they did for the ipad and stuff like that but swift playgrounds i think is a fantastic deal i've seen a lot of people use it and a lot of people learn a lot of great stuff from it for me personally it really helped me push myself to learn more code. And I had been messing around with Swift and some iOS development before that, but Swift Playgrounds really pushed myself to learn more. I guess the last thing I want to touch on is iOS 11. How did it change the way you work? How's like your doc set up and kind of dive into your iOS 11 kind of setup here? So iOS 11 was one of those things when, when it was announced at uh, WWDC, I was watching the live stream and I don't think I could have had a bigger smile on my face. I was so excited about iOS 11 and I didn't even take my own advice. I told everybody, yeah, I'm not going to install beta one. You know, it's, it's a bad idea. Five minutes after WWDC was over or the keynote was over and they had the betas up on the server, I was downloading the developer beta like right away i i was so excited about it <laughs> the beta really caused a ton of problems for me but <laughs> right. it, was, it, was, the apps and, yeah. oh yeah it broke luma fusion a few times i was i had an ipad air 2 at the time and i was like editing some videos on the ipad air 2 because i just couldn't get luma fusion to work <laughs> the biggest thing for me so the dock is huge i absolutely love the dock the ability to jump in between applications really quick I love the way the new multitasking is and the ability to just, you know, snap an application together. I know a lot of people aren't super big fans of this idea of applications being partners. I put Todoist as my task manager of choice, but I also put Fantastical right next to it so I can see how my day is going to go. So if I have any appointments that day and all the tasks that I need to do. But the biggest thing in iOS 11, I definitely would say is drag and drop. Drag and drop was one of those things that probably should have been there a lot sooner But I understand why they were kind of holding off and they wanted to implement it right. And it probably, you know, had to do with processing power and memory usage and all that stuff. But I think drag and drop is what kind of is going to start paving the way for a lot of people to go, okay, I can start doing my work from the iPad now because I can get information from one application to another without having to jump through all these hoops and using the workflow app and all that stuff. It's kind of funny. I was going through workflow the other day, the application, the automation application. 
And I was actually deleting a bunch of workflows that I don't need anymore because drag and drop unlocked so much stuff. Yeah, it's remarkable what you can do. And I love with the files app, just tap and hold in the dock to pull up the re- your recent files. And you can drag from there right into like a Safari upload. And we got like a temporary iCloud drive folder just for my scratch drive. I did the same thing. Yeah, ac- accessing files from the dock is brilliant. And it's a shame the implementation method for that, like Yoink and some other of those drag and drop apps can't really do that part of it. Are you using some of those like shelf apps for, for other purposes though? Yeah, I've been using uh, an app called Yoink. You had the developer on, right? From yep. uh, one of your previous, yeah. So I've been using Yoink and I've been switching between Yoink and Gladys. They both have their pros and cons. What I like about Yoink and it's it's kind of silly is I just like, I think it's designed a little bit nicer. I, I like the design plus the stacks. Stacks have been huge for me. So what Yoink is, for those that don't know, it, it's a drag and drop application. Anytime I'm working on a video or something like that, I'll put all the links to products I'm talking about, photos, some video clips. I'll drag it all into Yoink. And what I can do is I can stack all those together. So I can have all my clips, links, all that stuff. So I can just go into that stack and I can see everything I need for that project. It's just a really interesting application. I think it was a really interesting idea. And I'm really happy it's there. But it really feels like it should be native to the iPad. It really feels like that's something Apple should really bring natively, like a desktop. I think in iOS 12, it's time for Apple to rethink. It's called Springboard, but basically the home screen of the iPad in that widgets need to be there and that you need to be able to drag files to it and all sorts of different things. Yeah, you could almost, it'd be a major rethinking, but you could almost drag down from the top. And when you pull down, instead of getting that notification center, you could you could get your app screens there and then... You click home to get all your, your desktop, so to speak. I don't yeah, know. They, I, they could do some rethinkings. I completely agree. I think notification screen is one of those things in iOS 11 that probably bugs me the most, especially on the 12.9-inch iPad Pro. It's There's so much wasted space. It really needs to go back to having the widget view and the notifications all on one screen when you pull down, at least mm-hmm. in my opinion. Yeah. And then the thing that really bummed me was from iOS 10, and uh, you had the two-column widget view in like the today view. So you could have two columns of widgets and they took that away in iOS 11. And I, <laughs> I think I kept filing a bug report or a radar over and over again <laughs> to see if they would put it back <laughs> and they wouldn't do it. I think I filed that radar like four times and they just keep closing it. <laughs> yeah. That bummed me out when they took that away. But like the notification center just feels weird on the iPad now. On the iPhone, it feels right. Like, yeah, it you, does, pull, yeah. you see your notifications, things like that. But for me, I really want to get into my widget view a little quicker So when I have to pull down and then swipe over, it just feels like an extra step. And I know it's a second. Like, I I know it kind of sounds a little weird that I'm complaining about that. But it does feel like it takes longer and it slows my momentum down. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, yeah, I'm curious to see what iOS 12 will bring. I I hope they continue the momentum because if they can, it would be fantastic. Anything else you want to talk about before we uh, wrap it up? The other big thing that I want to see every single year is dark mode. (laughs) <laughs> it kind of seems like there needs to be a system-wide dark mode, especially since the iPhone X out now. Like, where's the system-wide dark mode? <laughs> There's got to be one coming, right? Yeah, needs to happen, especially for the 10. If it's, if it's only for the 10, that's it's fine. The OLED screen needs a dark mode. Uh, yeah, for sure. I'm also really excited to see what the future of the iPad is. Been hearing some rumors uh, lately about the future iPads will be bezel-less or the iPhone 10 design. So it's you know it's it's edge to edge and just has a notch and Face ID and stuff like that. And I think that'd be really awesome. I really like the idea of Face ID on the iPad. Since the iPhone X come out, they need to unify some gestures. Because mm-hmm. for me personally, I don't know about you, but when I try to go home on my iPad, I keep swiping up now. Yeah, I'm an and SE if- user, so I'm hoping they have a, a 10 mini is my hope. I, I want a small ah. 10. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> I like the SE. I like how small. I like the like It the feels size so good in your hand like in pocket. Like, yeah, and since I have two iPad Pros, like if I want bigger screens, I've, I've got iPads. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I'd love a premium small iPhone again, but the SE is great, especially for the, the money. You can't beat it. Oh, absolutely. With the dual iPad setup I have, I would hate to see the iPad go OLED because one of my iPads is a reference screen that has the same oh, thing up there for yeah. a while. I don't like burn it would be terrible. Also, face ID, oh, I'm concerned no. with I've got two iPads I'm using, which, you know, <laughs> the attention thing and are you going to, you know, wake up for me? I don't know. Yeah. The, Sorry, I have concerns for uh, how I use iPad. I, I think the iPad will eventually be OLED, but I don't think it's going to be anytime soon. It, as hard as it is to get OLED screens, I, I, I don't think they'll be able to get a 10.5-inch OLED screen or a 12.9-inch OLED screen anytime soon. And if they did, that price would be astronomical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
I mean, be beautiful for video, but uh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. The current screen, it's great. Uh, you know, and the it's it supports the HDR stuff. Like, it's one of the few devices it does. Yeah, yeah. It kind of bums me out because I I have to turn off True Tone. Some applications will automatically turn off True Tone for you, but if I'm editing color in any way on a photo or a video clip, there's no way to know for sure that that application disables True Tone. So I have to just disable it system wide because I don't want to take the risk that I accidentally forget to turn True Tone off. And with photo so, editing, oh my- that is a big deal. It's designed to like make you see the colors more accurately, but. I guess you know what colors are, what colors if it's off, I guess, right? Is yeah, because the... it shifts the screens. In my office area, I have a very yellow light right next to my iPad, so it would shift the screen too much. Oh, okay. And so when Night Shift first came out, I uh, had Night Shift on, and I was editing video, and I was doing color correction on the video, and Ooh. I couldn't figure out why I couldn't get the video to look right. And then I re- remembered, I and I had spent like 20, 30 minutes on this, like way too long. It's an embarrassing amount of time to admit that I spent on that, trying to figure out why it wasn't looking right. And then I remembered I had Night Shift on, and I immediately went and disabled it on all of my – I had I at that time, I had an iPad Air 2 and uh, an iPad Pro, and I disabled it on both my iPads because I was like, it's, it's, it's a nice feature to have, mm-hmm. but – Unless I can absolutely know for certain it's disabled when I open certain applications, there's no way I can have it on. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Uh, where can people find you on the interwebs? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Chris underscore Lolly, L-A-W-L-E-Y. Uh, a link to my YouTube channel is there if you're interested in videos about iPad stuff and things like that. My website is Christopher Lolly, uh, L-A-W-L-E-Y dot com. And uh, yeah, the, all the contact information's there. If you have any questions or anything, feel free to send me an email. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much again for your time. It's been great chatting with you. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been fantastic. Thanks again to Christopher for his time. You can find his work at www.christopherlolly.com. That's Christopher, L-A-W-L-E-Y.com. You can find the show notes over at iPadPros.net. Follow the show on Twitter at iPad Pros Podcast. You can follow me personally on Twitter at T-C-H-A-T-E-N. Feedback and topic requests, you can send those to iPadProsPodcast at gmail.com. If you have any audio feedback, you can send that to that same email address, iPadProsPodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>